inhibit it. Okay, and with that, I'm handing over to Roy Finkenberg. Well, hello, and uh, uh, thank you for the invite. It's uh, uh, it's good for me to be able to speak about this topic. Uh, we both, our countries, as well as Canada and many others, uh, share an indigenous past, which is unfortunately all too belatedly being recognized. Um, if I was giving this presentation in the United States, depending on where I was giving it, I'd also be uh, uh, starting with an acknowledgement in the case of where my sister and I, who's here, grew up, we'd be uh, acknowledging the Shawnee and the Fort Ancient culture, which were the original uh, keepers of that land. And if I was in my current hometown and where I teach in the Detroit area, I'd be acknowledging the three fires, the Potawatomi, the Odawa, and the Ojibwa. Um, this is a study that I kind of stumbled into, and I, I don't know about your experience as historians, but um, I find that serendipity is often what leads us on our way in these projects. And uh, um, this, this one is no different. I spent 40 years, I spent 40 years researching, writing and teaching about the African-American past um, and except at the most general level, have not delved into Native American or American indigenous studies, but I am quickly learning about this and have my wife would probably disgusted with the voluminous library I have of, of works on Midwestern Native Americans. Okay, it's not advancing. Do I use the side arrow on this one or? Side arrow, it's not doing that either. Oh, over here, I can just do this. Okay, gotcha. No. There, it did, it did, it did, it did. I had to hit it twice. Um, the woman you're seeing on the screen now, Helen Hornbeck Tanner, now, now passed, uh, was kind of the Dean of Historians of the Midwestern uh, Native American Experience. And I was intrigued by this quote in an interview that was published in 2009, in which she talked about the coexistence and cooperation between Native Americans and African Americans in the Midwest. And, and this quote speaks volumes. An important example of African and Indian cooperation was the Indian operated underground railroad, the network that helped uh, various times and places and ways helped freedom seekers run away enslaved African-Americans from the American South to either get to sanctuary um, or to find their way to Canada, British Canada. And then she closes with this line, nothing about this activity appears in the historical literature. In fact, uh, disgustingly so, particularly if you're trying to write about it, but it gives me an open, open field to at least uh, begin uh, some work on this. Tanner's assertion is largely true. Native American assistance to freedom seekers crossing through the Midwest, then often called the Old Northwest, uh, or seeking sanctuary in Indian villages in the region has largely been erased from uh, American Indian studies and from underground railroad studies. Two key examples uh, from the historiography uh, of the Underground Railroad demonstrate the extent of that deficiency. The first you see here, this first volume, Wilbur Siebert launched Underground Railroad Studies in, in the United States in 1898, the Underground Railroad from Slavery and Freedom. It's pioneering, but it's also a work that people starting to stu study the Underground Railroad, both community and academic historians, still have to go back to and engage. Uh, problematically for our purposes, though, uh, he collected testimony from hundreds of participants and witnesses in the struggle and convened this documentary record into a broad and influential work that's still in print, but he really only tapped white informants. Exactly two sentences in a work of 358 pages 
discuss the aid given to freedom seekers by Native Americans. In this case, the hospitality afforded at Chief Kinjuano's village on the Maumee River in Northwestern Ohio. Fast forward nearly 11 decades to the second work. Perhaps the most extensive and authoritative Underground Railroad interpretation said Seaver. Bound for Canaan, the Underground Railroad and the War for the Soul of America by journalist, uh, published in 2005 by journalist and popular historian Fergus Bordovich does only slightly better. It includes four sentences out of 439 pages on the assistance given to freedom seekers by Native Americans passing through the region. In this case, the aid provided to Jermaine Logwin and John Farney in Northern Indiana and Josiah Henson and his family in Northwestern Ohio, and we will revisit them uh, briefly later. Readers of these two volumes could be excused for thinking there was little interaction between freedom seekers and Native Americans in the Midwest. So I'd, I'd like to, in this presentation, try to briefly answer four questions about Native American or indigenous assistance to freedom seekers in the American Midwest. Why has this story been erased? What sources exist to tell the story? How did Native Americans assist freedom seekers? And why did they as assist freedom seekers? So why has this story been erased? My, my research suggests at least two primary reasons for the absence of Native Americans in the historiography of the Underground Railroad. First, both freedom seekers fleeing slavery in, primarily in the Upper South um, and Native Americans who assisted them in the Old Northwest, what today we know as the American Midwest, came from primarily oral cultures. Um, I assume that it's true in Australia, as it is certainly for most of the history of writing history in the U.S., that there is an extreme literary bias uh, that holds sway. And in uh, underground railroad studies, even, which depends more on community memory, perhaps, than most fields of history, uh, the oral tradition often is not respected or even uh, consulted. About five to 10% of freedom seekers at the most uh, were in some way literate at the time they escaped. There are some, as I'll show some examples, who did gain literacy afterwards and wrote about their experience of running away and being assisted by Native Americans. Second reason, and I, I put this map up for a, a reason, uh, local histories, which much of underground railroad study begins from, springs from in the US, particularly in the Midwest, um, tends to start the clock with white settlement and even ignore overlapping settlement between Native Americans and white settler uh, colonialists coming in. Uh, this map, my sister and I grew up in Ohio um, and right about the line you see between the, uh, in the Western part of the state between the uh, uh, settled area sectioned off into counties that you see there in green and the area to, in the northwest which seems to be tabula rasa uh, well that's that's a native american reserve from 1795 until the 1830s um, the shawnee as an example the shawnee which were in the area where we grew up um were removed by federal authorities under the Indian Removal Act of 1830. They were moved in 1832 from that area. The Finkenbeins and many other German immigrants moved in in 1833. Uh, became the basis of our hometown. Uh, but there was overlap and 
in the late 19th century and early 20th century, um, publishing houses in Chicago and New York urged local communities throughout the Midwest to write their um, settler histories, the county histories. They kind of had a formula that they showed them <laughs> that they should use. And I've gone through a number of these, particularly in Northwest Ohio, and it's as if Native Americans uh, did nothing with the Underground Railroad. In fact, they were gone by the War of 1812. And in fact, uh, they were very much there in, in the county histories in Northwest Ohio. They were there in some cases as late as 1843 uh, as a group before they were physically removed. And then there were small communities, isolated hamlets that continued after that date. But that's not something that we typically see. So as a result of interaction of freedom seekers and Native American communities across the Midwest has largely been obscured. And I think a, a slide that shows this well, uh, on, the, on the, we uh, the left side, if you're interested, this book by James Buss, Winning the West with Words, he's investigated the lower Midwest um, to look at pageants, festivals, um, county histories, a whole range of things to see how uh, Native American involvement uh, in their history and in the Underground Railroad was, uh, was represented. And he, he shows, he demonstrates how it's been uh, uh, obscured. And I've found the same thing in my own research in, um, in Northwest Ohio. Um, and this quote from Theodore Roosevelt, who in addition to being president and a rough rider and many other things, uh, was a historian, but one that we might not find uh, in sync with our current thinking. The white settler is merely moved into an uninhabited waste. He does not feel he's committing a wrong, for he knows perfectly well that the land is really owned by no one. Well, what sources exist to tell the story? Uh, despite the absence of Native Americans in the historiography of the Underground Railroad, uh, I found a scattered documentary record, an oral record, to demonstrate that freedom seekers received significant assistance from Indians in the pre-Civil War Midwest, American Midwest. And I'd like to talk briefly about five of these and add a sort of sixth one that I'm just starting to delve into um, that provide evidence of this interaction. The first of these evidences is simple geography. Um, this is Ty Miles, who uh, I consider a friend. She was at the University of Michigan, uh, left our state for Harvard, um, and uh, uh, just won the National Book Award for nonfiction, one of the major uh, awards uh, each year that historians lust after and uh, for a very interesting book, uh, All That She Carried, uh, about a slave mother and daughter. Um, but in speaking of the geography of the Underground Railroad, she notes that the routes that escaping slaves took went by, or I could say through, these communities. What freedom seekers going northward from the early days, and then after uh, white settlement in the lower Midwest, were either Native American trails or they were roads that had been developed on Native American trails. And as uh, freedom seekers went further northward towards Canada, uh, invariably they are going to be going through or, um, or by Native communities. Um, example in Indiana, the lower Midwest, the Michigan Road, was a major thoroughfare for freedom seekers making their way through central Indiana, um, north of the Wabash, which cuts off the northern third of Indiana, the Michigan Road, as it went towards the south bend of the St. Joseph River. Today we know as the city of South Bend, we know of the home of Notre Dame, the University of Notre Dame. Uh, that road literally connected dozens of Potawatomi uh, Indian villages. 
In Northwest Ohio, for example, Pulse Trace and the Scioto Trail ran through or past uh, Ottawa and Wyandotte reserves. In uh, another major trail ran through Shawnee villages in western, western Ohio um, before reaching the Maumee River. From about 1800 to 1843, there was what American slavery scholars call a maroon community. Typically, these are thought of in the South. Uh, these are communities formed by flight. In Brazil, we know them as Quilombos. In the American South and other places, the Caribbean, British Caribbean, typically as maroon communities. These are communities formed when freedom seekers run away from plantation slavery districts and form communities in isolated areas, frontier, swamps, mountains, areas beyond effective white control, government control. Negro Town is one of these that was actually formed on what you see there in the lighter color, the uh, Wyandotte Reserve, uh, northwest of contemporary Columbus, Ohio. And uh, you also see the the road running uh, through there, the trail um, that connected Negro Town to uh, uh, places further south, and it ended up becoming the home for a lot of Kentucky runaways over time. A second of these evidences can be found in the slave narratives. That's a term for autobiographies written by freedom seekers after their escape from bondage. Several of these tell of assistance received by Native Americans, and two provide particularly instructive content about this phenomenon in the Midwest. Uh, Josiah Henson, who you see there, um, who I guess I should note this week, given everything that's going on, actually in his later life, traveled to England and did meet Queen Victoria. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Josiah Henson, uh, in his narrative, traces his and his family's escape from Kentucky to Upper Canada, temporary Ontario, in 1830, eventually taking them up Hull's Trace through the heart of Indian country in northwestern Ohio. They were assisted there by Native Americans, probably Wyandotte, who fed them, quote, bountifully and gave them, quote, a comfortable wigwam to sleep in for the night. The next day, their Indian companions accompanied them along the route for a considerable distance, uh, probably about 25 miles, before finally pointing them towards the port of Sandusky on Lake Erie, where they could take a vessel across to Upper Canada. Stow away on a vessel. Um, there were a number of abolitionist captains of the American Great Lakes who would, and crewmen who uh, would allow uh, freedom seekers to stow away. Jermaine Logwin's narrative traces escape, his escape with John Farney from Tennessee to Upper Canada in 1935 by way of central Indiana. North of the Wabash, they were aided in several Potawatomi villages, receiving food, shelter, and direction from their Indian hosts. Upon reaching Michigan Territory, they turned eastward and crossed into Upper Canada. Both Henson and Logwin later achieved literacy and became well-known Black abolitionists. A third of these evidences survives in the Native uh, American oral tradition, um, and there are a host of examples. One of the privileges of COVID, and this can sound funny, one of the privileges of COVID for me is, as I'm holed up, teaching at home, doing webinars at home, and not able to travel to libraries and archives as the study was really taking hold, uh, was it forced me to rethink what the possibilities were that I could do at that time research-wise. And one of them, following a host of leads and uh, informants, uh, making contact with Potawatomi, Odawa, and Ojibwa elders who both could um, uh, give me a sense of the history, but also show how some of these stories relevant to the Underground Railroad were passed down from generation to generation. I mean, they could literally name grandfathers and fathers and, and others um, and gave me a provenance 
uh, for uh, this oral tradition. Uh, one of my favorites involves a family named the McSabe family in Western Michigan who were, were Odawa. And in uh, the early 1930s, um, one of the McSabe's was uh, active in helping to escort 20 freedom seekers north, then if you know the geography of Michigan, across the Mackinac Strait at night in war canoes to the Upper Peninsula where they then were escorted by Ojibwa uh, across to where they could reach Canada. And elders that I've interviewed say that it's pretty certain, and there's other evidence to back this up, pretty certain they ended up uh, on Manitoulin Island, which is a major island on the Canadian side of Lake Huron, uh, which for a time uh, became um, uh, an Indian reserve in Canada, First Nations Reserve. Um, Bill Dunlop inherited this. The Maxabe, who was one of the escorts, uh, told his son, uh, Louis Maxabe, which you'll see later, told him the tale. Uh, and he lived a long time and ultimately passed along to his son, John McSabe, who in Petoskey, which is a town in the northern part of Michigan, northwestern part of Michigan's Lower Peninsula. During the 1930s, the Great Depression, there was an Indian section of Petoskey where storytelling was rampant because there was one radio in the community and lots of storytellers and lots of back porches. And um, so John McSabe regularly would regale people with this uh, historical tale, this oral tradition. Bill Dunlop, as a young man who you see represented there, uh, heard the story many times, incorporated it into his repertoire. Uh, and in the early 2000s, a, an Ojibwe writer and artist who I've come to know quite well, um, uh, teased out of him because he was resistant for, to writing it down for a long time. Um, but she convinced him that this is a way the story could continue. And it is one of the outstanding parts of this book, award-winning book, The Indians of Hungry Hollow. I'll, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. My own, my own interviews during COVID um, with dozens of Ojibwe informants proved this to be the case. One elderly Ojibwe I talked to could trace the memory of helping freedom seekers through three generations of her family dating back to the 1850s and tell me chapter and verse who and what they did. Um, noting that Ojibwe in Northern Michigan remembered with pride that quote, they helped the blacks escape from slavery by quote, leading groups across the border. The fourth of these evidences comes from the memoirs, letters, and journals of informed white traders, trappers, missionaries, scientists, that's one I didn't think of initially, and soldiers who lived in or passed through Indian country in the, in the Midwest and recorded their experiences in textual form. My own research in Northwest Ohio has located a number of these, uh, typically um, traders in the case of the Maumee Valley, and um, letters and journals of Moravian and Methodist missionaries and U.S. soldiers in the War of 1812 as it pertains to Negro towns, this uh, maroon community I, I mentioned earlier. A particularly instructive example, I think, is the one you see here. Um, the memoir of Elijah the Porter of Wisconsin. She and her husband, Jeremiah, Presbyterian missionaries in Green Bay, which we all know thanks to the NFL, um, if we know anything about American football, um, they were stationed there and they cooperated with Native Americans on the Stockbridge Reservation and the Brothertown Reservation to the south um, in aiding fugitive slaves making their way through eastern Wisconsin to Great Lake ports where again they could stow away on vessels. Um, in looking at some of these uh, uh, writings, one of the things that ultimately uh, shocked me was the person who 
who was most active in carrying them in his wagon from the Stockbridge and Brothertown uh, res Reserve up to Green Bay uh, in this secret network known as the Underground Railroad, um, a name, man named Lemuel Goodell, in an earlier time, 20 years earlier, had been the jailer in a famous case in Detroit that had kept freedom seekers in jail. And my sister and I were joking about, you know, if he had a Damascus Road experience or something along the way that caused him to go from being an enforcer of the fugitive slave laws to uh, a violator of the fugitive slave laws. A final evidence appears in the bodies of freedom seekers and Native Americans and their descendants. Um, this takes us into the realms of genealogy and the DNA record, and particularly applies to those freedom seekers who sought permanent sanctuary in Native American villages in the Midwest. Native American genealogist Don Green, for example, who I've come to know, has found extensive evidence of African American ancestry among the Shawnee in the region. A case in point is Caesar. All we have is a modern rendition. Um, he was a Virginia fugitive who escaped across the Appalachian Mountains to the Ohio country in 1774 and was adopted by the Shawnee. He married a mixed race Shawnee woman named Sally and he fathered children known in translation to history as Sally's white son and Sally's black son, evidence of you know, different skin color. Um, the latter is still listed as Sally's black son on the role of Shawnee migrants who moved from their Ohio reservation to the Oklahoma frontier in 1832. Um, and I found that serendipitously uh, by visiting a museum exhibit in the Cincinnati area in 2017, Barb and I did, my wife and I, um, and I was tracking this family and I hadn't found past, I think it was past 1825, anything about Sally's black son. And um, there in the museum exhibit on called Exile on the removal of Shawnee and Wyandotte from Ohio to the Trans-Mississippi frontier was a ledger kept by one of the federal agents that escorted them westward where he wrote down the names of everybody they were escorting. And it just by happenstance was open to a, a middle page blocked open and there was written, handwritten in his, uh, uh, in his handwriting, Sally's black son. And so sometimes serendipity pays off. Um, additionally, DNA has been helpful. Researchers, uh, including a guy named Clyde Winters in Chicago, have suggested that a particular enzyme, um, RM173Y chromosome, uh, is found among certain groups of Native Americans in significant volume. Um, this is a chromosome that people of European descent almost never have in their DNA. People of Asian, East Asian descent almost never have in their DNA, including the Siberians that we think may have been the ancestors of contemporary Native Americans. It doesn't turn among, up among Native Americans native to the area west of the Mississippi. Where it turns up is in African south of the Sahara, including their descendants in the Americas. Uh, and it turns up in high volume among Native American groups that assisted or um, brought into the fold uh, freedom seekers, African American freedom seekers. The Ojibwa in northern Michigan, uh, about 89, in, in sampling, about 89% of them have this enzyme. Uh, the Seminoles in the south in Florida, which helped. Freedom seekers in the South flee to the Everglades. I think it's about 56%. Um, so some DNA evidence of this kind of interaction. Um, these are examples from Indian country in the Midwest of what historian uh, William Lauren Katz calls black Indians. 
Well, I'm currently exploring a sixth uh, possible evidence, council paintings. When Native Americans met with US or Canadian officials in councils or treaty negotiations, they were often memorialized in paintings of the various delegate, delegations. Sometimes these delegations included individuals who appear to be of African descent. For instance, the uh, a person in this painting, second from the left. Uh, an example are two paintings, actually. There's another one like this from Rudolf Steiger of a deputation of Ojibwa to a meeting with Canadian authorities in 1815. Steiger was a Swiss soldier who fought as a mercenary for the British in the War of 1812. Uh, and you see the uh, uh, person who he uh, paints here who seems to be um, of African descent, given the hair, given the skin color. Um, we know that Steiger uh, shipped the paintings back to Europe and they remained in the family until 1989. They uh, were bought uh, at a Sotheby's auction and now reside in the National Art Gallery of Canada. Um, we also know from other sources that uh, people of African descent were integrated into the Ojibwe in Canada and in the American Midwest. So this, uh, this makes a lot of sense. Well, some subjects of his, uh, historical research, you know, students doing it, the PhD students doing a dissertation hope for this is that they could find a stock of just a rich stock of materials in, um, uh, an archive collection and work from that. And in fact, uh, this is not one of those kinds of studies. So I'm still locating things that, that might be of substance in my study. Well, how did Native Americans assist freedom seekers? Um, mentioned a couple of ways that I think uh, this happened. Uh, and I see, uh, two progressions really um, at, at, at work. Um, you see sanctuary in Native American villages being offered, particularly in the lower Midwest, the Shawnee, the Wyandotte, um, the Ottawa, the Potawatomi in Indiana, the Miami in Indiana. Um, and, you know, there's, there's interesting snippets, for instance, when William Henry Harrison, who later becomes an American president, was a general during the War of 1812, invaded the Miami villages because the Miami side of the British invaded the Miami villages in the Mississippi in Indiana. Uh, he and his soldiers were surprised at all of the African Americans that were running away with the Native Americans from these villages as they invaded. Um, other people in the past have seen these, and, and we all know that uh, uh, the importance of a topic of historical study isn't clear, and you don't look for that stuff until you decide that it might be important, right? <laughs> um, but as I said, two progressions at work. One is chronological, moving from the American Revolution to the Civil War. It's really about the time of the American Revolution that both slaveholders and their African Americans enslaved African-Americans are taken west of the Appalachians, places like Kentucky and Tennessee, and begin then escaping northward into the Ohio country, the Indiana country, and so forth. Um, the other is geographic. Uh, as the new nation that is the United States begins to wrestle with indigenous issues, one of the things that they pass, Andrew Jackson uh, pushes through Congress is something called the Indian Removal Act of 1830. And it's implemented then in the lower Midwest over the next decade and a half and removes the vast majority of uh, lower Midwest indigenous peoples to the trans Mississippi West, Kansas, Oklahoma, those kind of places today. Um, that act is not implemented in the same way as in the late 1840s, 1850s, particularly 
uh, you begin to uh, see efforts to deal with the Indian problem uh, in the upper Midwest, the, the upper Great Lakes, we sometimes call it. And um, the vast majority of those people remain and are not removed. Now, they may be removed internally, but the states pushed a little bit here and there. But they become, in the two decades right before the Civil War, they become the primary indigenous people involved in helping freedom seekers in the upper Midwest. Uh, uh, so, um, and they do take people into their villages and provide sanctuaries, just the Shawnee did with Caesar and so forth. Um, the uh, increasingly over time, what happens is there's an interest by freedom seekers in getting to Canada. In 1793, two things are happened. Uh, two things happen legislatively. The United States passes its first Fugitive Slave Act at the federal level. And it allows freedom seekers to be tracked down by their owners or delegated person anywhere in the United States, get a certificate from a local magistrate and return them south to slavery. Um, that same year, uh, what becomes Ontario, Upper Canada, the Legislative Assembly passes what they call the Act Against Slavery, which begins the process of phasing out the very limited number, I think 300 slaves they had in the, you know, in the colony over time. But it establishes that new African Americans coming into the colony will be presumed to be free. And so when word of this makes its way to slave communities in the Upper South, and it does uh, very quickly, uh, they start making their way north and are helped by freedom seekers. Um, just give a, a quick glimpse of Canadian extradition policy that helps push this along. Um, developing Canadian extradition policy also played a role in making Upper Canada a destination for Kentucky freedom seekers. In mid-1819, John Beverly Robinson, Upper Canada's Attorney General, made it clear to American officials that bureaucrats in the colony would oppose any efforts to extradite runaway slaves. He's actually talking to the American Secretary of State who does this. Whatever may have been, and I'm quoting, whatever may have been the condition of the Negroes in the United States, he opined, here they are free for the enjoyment of all civil rights and among them the right to personal freedom. And again, word of this spread quickly in slave communities of the Upper South uh, through what Marvin Gaye of Motown called the grapevine. <laughs> they heard it through the grapevine. Um, and so by the time you get past the, the uh, War of 1812, large numbers of freedom seekers are coming northward and they're being helped by American Midwestern Indians. Let me just give you back to the oral tradition example I suggested earlier and just give you a quick take on that um, so you can visualize it. This is an 1831 drawing of the Grand River in what is today contemporary Grand Rapids in, West, in uh, Western Michigan. And uh, kind of off to the left, you, there's a uh, an Odawa village, and to the right of the picture is there. You would see a uh, another Odawa village. Is the one uh, a village? The one to the right, very acculturated, assimilated, willing to adopt white ways in terms of farming, literacy, Christianity, etc. The one to the left, very antagonistic, unwilling to assimilate, and resistant to the encroaching white settlement. And they are the ones, the one. To the left, the South Odawa village, the one that uh, this Mixabe family was part of and helped uh, uh, these 20 freedom seekers get north to what I call a northern door to Canada. Um, this is a rough map of the route they would have taken. I've 
I've tried to put myself to the extent I can empathically in the, in the uh, shoes of a, uh, one of these 20 freedom seekers and being handed off from Odawa then to Ojibwa, taken across the Mackinac Straits, which can be foreboding in, in the middle of the night uh, in, in these war canoes and, and making their way to Canada, but they did. Um, this is where the handoff would have occurred um, it's an 1842 uh, drawing by a French ethnographer of the Ojibwa village uh, at the what was usually a council site where the three fires, the Potawatomi, Ojibwa, and Odawa leaders would meet to discuss important uh, issues on the south shore of the Mackinac Strait. And this is Louis McSabe. His father was one of the escorts for these freedom seekers. A boy at the time of the uh, uh, event, he passed it down uh, to his son, who eventually told it enough times that Bill Dunlop, that you saw, uh, memorized it. Well, why did Native Americans assist freedom seekers? I think they did it for a variety of reasons and a variety of factors. As the population of Native American villages in the Midwest declined in the early uh, 19th century, Native Americans found it valuable to welcome freedom seekers who brought additional skills, knowledge, and bloodlines into their villages, just as white captives and captives from other tribes had done a century earlier. My own research in the Ottawa and the Maumee River Valley in Ohio has shown that the Ottawa expected freedom seekers living among them to contribute in a variety of ways for the benefit of the entire community. Some fugitives brought skills like metalworking or literacy. Others may have carried new seeds with them that enriched the community's diet. All could labor in the vast fields of corn alongside these towns, which provided a major staple of their diet. In villages like Kinjawana's town, which saw its population halved in the decade of the 1820s, fugitive slaves, mostly male, could also enrich the community's bloodlines, and, and did. This view is confirmed by Canadian Indigenous scholars Zainab Amahadi and Benita Lawrence, who observed that, quote, Indigenous communities looked to African newcomers as people who could inject new life, new blood, and new ideas into nations threatened by European disease and genocidal policies. Africans who spoke the languages of the settlers and knew their battle tactics were an asset to many communities defending themselves against or negotiating European aggression. Native Americans in the upper Great Lakes also felt a sense of kinship with freedom seekers they encountered, often referring to them as brothers or cousins. Ojibwa Methodist missionary John Hall told African Americans after the Civil War that, quote, old Indians used to call colored men cousins. This usually came from an awareness of common suffering at the hands of white settlement and expansion. Hall observed that, quote, Indians are poor just like blacks are, and we stand on one platform, we have suffered just the same, kind of my enemy, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, more or less. Peter Jones, uh, another Ojibwa Methodist missionary, believed that Native Americans comes next to the Negro, the quoting, comes next to the Negro and the endurance of wrongs inflicted by the white man. Jones claimed that Annabellum Ojibwa frequently referred to freedom seekers as, quote, our fellow suffering brethren. As a result, they deeply commiserated with their plight. A particular reason for Native American assistance to freedom seekers reaching the Annabellum Midwest seems to be growing indigenous concern with slavery in the South. Historian Arvid Smallwood has noted that, quote, as slavery spread, and the cruelty of slavery became known among Native Americans. Many began to sympathize with Africans and despise the institution of slavery. Many Indian nations began to harbor runaway slaves, unquote. Again, Jones claimed that a major reason for Ojibwa hospitality towards African Americans was, quote, their unhappy state in being bound with the iron band of slavery, unquote. In my research, I've located extensive evidence of 
anti-slavery meetings. We, you know, I began my career as an abolitionist historian, and we tend to think of people meeting in, you know, churches or in meeting halls in, uh, you know, Puritan New England villages kind of thing. And and in fact, I I found evidence in um, some textual uh, recounting of Native American anti-slavery meetings being held in different parts of the Midwest, particularly the Stockbridge and Brotherton in Wisconsin and the Ottawa, Ottawa or Ottawa in Michigan. Um, and so we see another uh, motivation to help freedom seekers um, in the Midwest by Native Americans. Um, often overlooked is the role of Native American hospitality. And that's one of the things I found out in these COVID era uh, interviews with elders. Um, Native American hospitality customs in prompting indigenous peoples in the American Midwest to aid freedom seekers. Especially useful example of the Potawatomi of Wisconsin, Northern Illinois and Indiana and Southern Michigan. From the earliest days of Native American European contact, white explorers, fur traders, um, missionaries and settlers commented on the extravagant hospitality of the Potawatomi. Early French explorers in Wisconsin observed that the Potawatomi, quote, loved nothing better than to entertain strangers who passed that way. F.A. Dewey, one of the original white settlers in Southern Michigan, noted that, quote, true Indian hospitality consisted in, the, in freely giving of the best of the best of their provision and of welcome shelter in the wigwam, unquote. When geologist William H. Keating, Philadelphia geolo geologist looking for the source of a river in the upper Midwest, um, interviewed Matea, um, we're getting close, uh, a Potawatomi leader in northern Indiana in 1823, he was informed to a stranger, if he be an enemy, it is true that he will extend the most unrestricted hospitality, all that the most liberal spirit can do to secure him a friendly and fraternal reception is cordially done. When I virtually interviewed groups of Potawatomi elders during the COVID-19 pandemic, they assured me and gave me lots of contemporary examples of this practice. This customary uh, hospitality extended to African-American freedom seekers who reached Potawatomi villages. When Keating interviewed Matea, uh, he explained his people's attitude about racial differences. Matea noted that the Potawatomi believed that the master of life had created all races of men and didn't trouble themselves much with a person's race. Um, the uh, this is a very different experience than what happens in the late 18th and 19th century between freedom seekers running away from enslavement and uh, uh, indigenous peoples. In the American Midwest, for reasons we can talk about in the Q and A, um, you see this shift increasingly towards helping freedom seekers, disliking slavery in the American South, et cetera. In the American South, uh, freedom seekers in the earlier period, the colonial period, or the American Revolution, had often run to Native American villages. As Native Americans, the Cherokee and others, are trying to hold on to uh, their land, they tend to assimilate, develop a written language, become Christian, uh, build European style farmsteads, build a Supreme Court building uh, in, that we visited in North Georgia. Um, but one of the other things they do is they become slaveholders. And even if not, they're not slaveholders, if a runaway slave runs away to a Native American village in the South, particularly after 1800, increasingly they're returned for reward or kept as a slave. And um, one of the explanations I have for that is they were trying to hold on to their culture and hold on to their land by copying, by emulating uh, the uh, 
culture and lifestyle of those who were trying to remove them, to drive them out, and ultimately did in many cases. Uh, so you have a, a, a somewhat unique regional experience in the American Midwest, and obviously linked to the connection to Canada and the fact that the old Northwest, which becomes the bulk of the American Midwest, started in the federal document that established uh, that area as the old Northwest with a prohibition against slavery in that region. It's ultimately then, uh, in many ways, copied, extended, embraced by uh, the Native Americans in that region. Thank you. And I'd welcome any questions. You just move the computer a tiny bit so okay. we can keep track of uh, people in the regions. Thank you so much, and thank you for keeping to time. Thank you for um, you know making up for our blunders with the, <laughs> with the um, equipment. Um, I'm just going to try and make sure I can see everyone. Uh, Probably need to end uh, the. Oh, and also, I wanted to 